Where would he go? What would he do? He would go to his church. He would clean it up. That's what he did. When he came into town, he went to his temple and he cleaned it up. When Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time, he could have gone many places. He could have gone to Israel's enemies, the Romans, and went to Herod's fortress and had a State of the Union meeting with Herod to talk about how we're going to have peace here in Jerusalem, just like all the national, or world leaders came into San Francisco this last week to have a meeting. Jesus could have done that. Jesus could have went to the educational centers and spoke at the Jerusalem school board and had a meeting there and addressed the abuse and the misguidance of children and young minds. Jesus could have gone to the Jerusalem Theological Seminary and ripped them for their false teaching and their emphasis on traditionalism. He didn't go any of those places. When he came into the city, he went to the temple. He went to his house. Typically, when I talk about homelessness, I equate it to Jesus, who was homeless himself. But I do think I stand corrected in that. Because if I read this text right, he did have a house, and it was his temple. And his house is actually, just according to value, his house is more valuable than any other house in the world, then and today. That little place, that little temple mount is the most sought after piece of real estate in the world. And it'll continue to be that way. So Jesus did have a house, the temple. Peter tells us judgment starts at the household of God. Why does God's judgment start there? It starts there because the temple was the most important enterprise, the most important entity in Israel. And by extension, the temple was the most important enterprise in the world because God's purpose for the temple was to reach all the nations and to have influence in all the nations. So, therefore, if God's temple is off course, then everything else in culture will be off course too. Right? If God's working in and through temple and the temple is wrong, that affects everything in culture. And so it is, it's the epicenter for truth and God's ways. So going back to the original question, if Jesus were to come back today, where would he go? What would he do? He would go to his church. He would go to Christian churches. He would go to churches that claim the name of Christ, that claim allegiance to Jesus. Why? Because the church, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3.15, is the household of God. Today, the church is the household of God. The church is a pillar and foundation for the truth, Paul tells us. So again, if the church is off course, everything else in society will be off course. So just how it was with the temple, now it is today with the church. And sharing that, I hope you get a sense of the responsibility that we have to our town, to our county, to our state, The church is important. The church is vital. Maybe looking back a couple years, the church is essential. So this is a sobering text. Jesus told his followers in the Sermon on the Mount, his most famous sermon, he said, you are the light of the world. You are, plural, you, plural, you, followers, are the salt of the earth. A city on a hill can't be hidden. 
So my responsibility this morning is twofold. I want to help you. I need to answer two questions. First of all, I need to help you understand God's heart for the temple and the purpose of the temple. Last week, we considered God's heart for Israel. That was where Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem, uncontrollably sobbing over Jerusalem for their rejection of him. And now we see God's heart for his temple. So we're kind of moving it actually in a little bit, right? If we're thinking of concentric circles. And then after I help you understand the temple, then I need to help you understand, well, how do we apply these things to the church today? And so that's why I just wanted to kind of slow it down here, just hit these few verses, because I think there's really important things for us to to consider. So first of all, helping you understand God's heart for his temple, why is this such a big deal to Jesus? And if I could just give you a quick history and pictures, um, this was actually the tabernacle. So as Moses was leading the people out of Egypt into the promised land, into Israel, they had kind of a circus tent for the temple that traveled around. And so this was that tent that was mobile, and that was the tabernacle. And they had the Holy of Holies in there, the Ark of the Covenant. They had golden holy vessels, um, and that was how it started. And, And then, if we could go to the next picture, this is the Temple Mount today. This is Um, The Dome of the Rock, that big gold building there, that's a mosque. The mosque down at the bottom there is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That's where the Muslims believe that Allah ascended to heaven. But that's the Temple Mount today. Um, The Jewish... This isn't isn't all of Jerusalem. This is just a a quarter of Jerusalem. To the north of there, up the screen is the um, Arab quarter... Actually, I'm sorry, Uh, this is the Arab quarter. Then go up a little north is the Christian quarter. That's where Jesus, they believe Jesus was buried, up in the north of this. To the left is the Greek Orthodox quarter, and to the south um, west would be the Jewish quarter. Um, So that's today, that's Jerusalem today. So next slide. Uh, This is a model of what, they believe the temple would have looked like back in Jesus' day. Um, This is the the temple that Herod actually constructed. This isn't Solomon's temple. And so that's a model. You see those people walking around. That's in Jerusalem. You can go see this kind of a model of what it would have looked like back then. And so that's the temple mount there, that walled portion there at the bottom. I'm going to just kind of give you a closer picture of that in the next slide. This is, uh, again, that model Um, what that would have looked like. Um, The reason this is important for us in our story this morning is because Jesus is talking about this whole Temple Mount area, and it would have been that those outer courts were called the courts of the Gentiles. That's where the Gentiles could come in and do their worship. The inner court is then the court of the women, and there's another court inside of that, which is the court of the Israelites, and there's another court inside of that, which is the court of the priests, and then there's that bigger building there. That's where the Holy of Holies was. So that's um, just what it would have looked like. And um, when I see this, I think of the fair, okay? I think of our Sonoma County Fair, and I think of the main pavilion, and I think of what Jesus is dealing with here. He's dealing with this, what turned into a, just a, a circus of selling things and Um, taking advantage of people. And so just imagine, and and all that Gentile court area, just all the tables that would have been set up to sell the pigeons and the sheep and the sacrificial animals and the money changers and um, probably had paraphernalia and merchandise and all kinds of things they were selling. Um, Jackets and hoodies and pocket knives and uh, who knows. Slingshots. Anytime we analyze the church for leadership, we do what's called a SWOT analysis, a SWOT analysis. And what we do is we just take some time to think about what are the strengths of the church, what are the weaknesses of the church, what are the opportunities of the church, what are the threats of the church. And so our elders will actually, in January, take about three hours, have a three-hour meeting 
to really take some time, think about that for our church, and then each leader is given a certain amount of points, an equal amount of points to give to any one of those things that comes up, and then we take the top four or five items, and then those become what we really want to focus on and work on the next year. So that's how we do an analysis of the church. If I could use that same analysis for the temple, um, we think about the strengths of the temple. The strengths of the temple is, the number one strength is it's the house of prayer. This is God's, this is my house, it is a house of prayer. So the temple is a house of prayer. And what that means is that's where people can be reconciled to God. Because we're sinners, we've offended this holy and righteous God. God says the wages of sin is death. There would need to be some kind of death to satisfy the wrath of God for our sin. So people would bring in some kind of animal sacrifice into the temple to atone for our sin, and then you could have this time of confession and this time of forgiveness, this time of prayer with God. This was, so the temple is, first and foremost, a house of prayer, a house of confession and forgiveness and talking to God. Uh, 1 Kings 8 talks about the, the temple being a house of prayer. 1 Samuel 1, Hannah goes into the temple to pray. Um, the psalmist in Psalm 73 has a, has a dilemma. And the dilemma is he sees the world and the struggles that are in the world and the injustices that are in the world, but he also knows who God is and that God is sovereign and God is good and God is in control. And so the psalmist in Psalm 73 is having this dilemma of how is this and this? Like, how does all this work together? And then in Psalm 73, if we could just show that in those verses um, 16 and 17, but when I thought how to understand this dilemma, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary or the temple of God, then I discerned their end. So I love that because it shows that being in God's temple revealed the answers that he was looking for. And, and it even kind of happens today. I, I don't get to go to church like you get to go to church because I'm the one up here preaching and teaching. But when I do get to go to church or I go to conferences or whatever, there is just something that happens as I sit there and listen to the Word of God preached that things get more clear about life. A lot of my answer, the, the questions that I have get answered. I, I hope that happens with you as you come to church. I hope some answers are, you get answers, but also maybe more questions too. Um, anyway, that happened in the, in the temple. Psalm 27, 4, the temple was a place of meditation. Psalm 65, 4, the temple was a place of goodness. Um, and then I also want to show you this Psalm 27, 4. Um, David said, One thing have I asked the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So that's, it just kind of shows you like how awesome this place was, what a blessing this place was. It was so good, such a neat place. It was inspiring, it was quiet, it was peaceful, it was beautiful. It's good. Weaknesses of the temple. How was the temple then weak or, or insufficient? Why, why did God have a plan to replace this temple? Why isn't there still a temple in Jerusalem? First of all, I would, I would suggest that it was isolated, it was local, it was hard to get to. It was only there in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem's a thousand feet above sea level, it would have been hard to, even higher than that, it's hard to, even hard to get to. So it'd be like for us if, hey, if you want to meet with God, you have to drive to Tahoe City and go to Squaw Valley, and there you can meet with God, right? It, it, that would be a challenge. Secondly, the temple was also limited. Hebrews 9.9 9 says about the temple and about the sacrifices, um, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So all those sacrifices that were brought into the temple could not perfect the conscience of the worshiper. And the reason it, they couldn't perfect the conscience was because 
the sacrifices were not perfect. They were, they were, they, I don't know how else to, to say it. They just weren't perfect. Christ then is the perfect sacrifice for our sin. So if you do want a perfect conscience, which I think every human does, you can find that perfect conscience in Christ. If your conscience is messed up, which most of us, we do have messed up consciences, Christ can perfect your conscience. That, you could worship and go home just after thinking about that. And so, for them it wasn't, it was, it was limited because it was, they had to keep coming every year to offer these sacrifices for atonement for sin. The opportunities of the temple were expansive. Um, the opportunities were expansive. So in, in Mark and Matthew, they also talk about Jesus coming in and cleansing the temple. I believe it's in Mark's account where he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. So it's the, the house of prayer was for all the nations. It was expansive. Jesus was a light to the nations. God's desire is that the world and the Gentiles would worship the true and living God through, through temple and through sacrifice and what God had established, right? Uh, John 3, 16, for God so loves the world. He loves the whole, all the nations. So the temple was that epicenter for reconciliation. And then we have the threats. So you have the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. What are the threats to the temple? Um, I'm going to suggest three threats. I think they're in our text this morning. I would present them to you. First of all, the, the, one of the threats is, is through the leadership. And what happened, and I'm just going to use what happened in Israel, what Jesus is referring to here in Luke 19 as the threats. The leadership was greedy. The leadership was, had a love of money. The leadership was worldly. And out of those three issues of the hearts of the leaders, they then manipulated weak people. And they, they manipulated people spiritually. And we call that today, we call it spiritual abuse. And there's still religious leaders out there practicing spiritual abuse. One of the things they would do is, like, let's say, let's say Rhett and Julie, are Rhett and Julie here? Rhett and Julie, is Julie here? Well, this isn't going to work then. No, I'm just kidding. So, so let's say Rhett and Julie and, and Zoe and Allie, they, they raise a lamb to take to temple for Passover to offer that sacrifice for the sins of their family to have atonement. And so they raise that lamb over on Laguna Road. They have a little place for it and they keep it healthy and unblemished, and they put that into Rhett's Chevy. What do you have? Silverado. A Silverado. Now, the Silverado typically breaks down, so they have to stop in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> Buy a Toyota. And then, so then they, they, they get that lamb all the way to, to Squaw Valley, right? And they get that lamb out and they put that lamb before the priests. And if it was in Jesus' day, they would say, hey, thanks for offering the lamb, but it's got some blemishes. Um, go over there and get a pre-approved one. We have them already ready to go. And just pay the extra 10 times the amount of normal because you have to have this now and then take that lamb to be your sacrifice. So you see how they would abuse people and manipulate people. So Rhett and Julie would be like, next year we're like, we're not going to do that again. We're just going to take it in the shorts and just go buy a lamb, buy their lamb. What's, what's the point? And so that was the kind of spiritual abuse that was happening. And there was these money changers, they'd have to offer a half a shekel, but their currency wasn't in shekels, it was in Roman uh, currency, and so they'd have to pay to get a shekel, and it was, again, 10 times the amount of normal, and it was just a mess. So that was through the greed, the love of money, and the worldliness of the leaders. Um, in, in 
John's account of the temple cleansing, which I think there's two. John takes the first one and then Jesus leaves for three years and then comes back and there's another cleansing. So they're kind of bookends of his ministry. But in John's account, he says, Jesus says, you've made my father's house a house of merchandise. House of merchandise. Second way it was a threat, what happened here was And I would suggest this was a neglect by the people to allow the Temple Mount to become a den of robbers. So on that Temple Mount, it had become a place where just evil thieves would come to take advantage of people. So a den of robbers, literally a robber's den, was a cave along a road where robbers would hang out in this cave, and then when people went by, they would, they would steal and, and loot them. And so they allowed the whole Temple Mount to become just a den of robbers. They allowed just evil people to come in and just take advantage of people through all these entrepreneurial enterprises. What you need to understand is evil people, like thieves and robbers, are looking for ways to exploit people, take advantage of people. And a lot of you guys are just good people, so you don't really understand this. I was a thief and a robber. I looked for ways to, for cracks to, to steal. And so you're always looking for weaknesses. And it, it was like a game. My mom would go, say, like, Lance, why did you steal that? Because it was fun. And so the, the reason I share that with you is because the, the church can still be a den for robbers. And what I see today is with all the, the sexual abuse that takes place in churches... It's because these, these, this den of perverts see the church as a weak place to, to do their, their nasty thing. And so the den of robbers, it, it's a real deal. You have the church, and the church has to protect. The leadership protects, yes, but the, the church in general has to protect as well because it's, it's, it's a huge possibility this idea of the, the spiritual place being a den of robbers. And I'll get into that a little bit later. The third threat then was rules. Rules were more important than relationship. And so what happened with Israel is they just got into the duty of religion. And so they would bring their sacrifices and it was just, they were just going through the motions of religion. They were just going to church on Sunday to appease their conscience or whatever they were doing. It, it, it was more important. This stuff became more important than a relationship with the living God. So God said something in the Old Testament. He said, to obey is better than sacrifice. <laughs> you guys are just sacrificing your animals, just wanting my forgiveness. But what I really want is obedience. I want this relationship with you and I want you to obey me. So rules then would overtake relationship. So Jesus cleanses it. Jesus cleanses this temple. And it's actually hard to imagine one person going into that temple mount. Again, think of it like the Sonoma County Fair. Think of me going to the fair one day like in my mind, I'm like, this fair is for agriculture. This is for kids to sell animals. And look at this pavilion, and look at all these rides. Look what you've made of this place. And I just go in and just start throwing stuff around. I wouldn't get very far. There'd be some other big roadies, ride, you know, ride people. There'd be people looking to fight. This guy wants to fight. There would be security. I think it's called the Praetorium Guard. I think that's the security service we use. Anyway, it's kind of a funny name for... Anyway. Um, 
But what I'm getting at is I think this is a miracle. I, I think what Jesus does here is a miracle. And a miracle is a sign to show us attributes of God. And this miracle shows us the righteous anger of God. That is an attribute of God. He is a righteously angry God. And this is the miracle that shows it. In Matthew, it says that he flipped tables, he flipped chairs, he, mark, he drove out sellers, he drove out buyers. John, he, he made a whip. Like, he didn't just go buy a whip, he made a whip. Hmm. 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 What I'm getting at is Jesus got physical. He got physical physical. And I think this is a hard reality for those who only see Jesus as a gentle, meek Savior. He's not just a gentle, meek Savior. He has righteous anger. He makes whips. <laughs> he gets physical. And I, it's important because for you to follow him faithfully, you have to see him as he is. And he is the lion and the lamb. He is the lion and the lamb. And my perception of church, and I've said this to you before, I think the church is too lamby. We're too nice sometimes, too kind. And again, if the church is the epicenter for truth and culture, and we're going to sit here and be lammy, right? Then, then we're, we're not living up to our responsibility as church. And sometimes I get kind of, people accuse me of being too harsh or too direct. I'm like, somebody has to say it. I'm sorry I'm not nice all the time. But they still keep inviting me back to these meetings. Okay. Saying that, I also think it's important to say that some pastors take this scripture as their model scripture for how to do ministry. And they go, they go too far the other way. And you say, well, why are you always acting like that? Well, Jesus cleansed the temple. Jesus cleansed the temple. Jesus cleansed the temple. Yeah, but there's so many more scriptures about Jesus being kind and meek and gentle and humble. You get what I'm talking about. Second question then is, how do we apply this to the church today? How do we apply this to the church today? What can the church do to safeguard the purity of the church, to stay on God's course? Let me offer you five challenges, just some applications to this. First of all, I would encourage you to have a zeal and love for the church. Have a zeal and love for the church. You need to understand, and that's what I tell people, the church is our best shot in culture of having a loving community, a forgiving community. Church is the best shot we have. This is what I tell unbelievers. Like, you might have all your issues with the church. It's the best shot you've got at a loving community. In John 2, 17, the disciples saw what Jesus did in cleansing the temple, and, he, and they said, this is like that scripture, a zeal for your house will consume me. They saw Jesus' zeal for his house consuming him. And Jesus' zeal, and this is really important, their zeal was, Jesus' zeal is with knowledge. When, when you have a zeal for something and a passion for something, it has to be accompanied with knowledge. Zeal without knowledge is dangerous. And so you see churches that are just out in the media and they're picketing and like, hate, like hateful picketing and they're just sharing messages that are hateful, right? They have a zeal and they have a passion, but it's without knowledge. Like read the rest of the Bible. Peter says when you deal with unbelievers, do, treat them with respect and dignity. 
So have zeal, but also have it with knowledge. For the church, what is the church? Ecclesia. The church is, that's the Greek word for church, ecclesia. The church is the called out ones. It's those who God calls out of the world to be his followers. Timothy calls it a household of God, a pillar in support of the truth. Uh, Paul calls it that to Timothy. Uh, the church is salt and light in the community. And hopefully as you grow in Christ, your zeal and passion will, will grow for the church. It's part of just growing in Christ. And I, you know, I've followed the Lord for 26 years now, and I, I, the church always, it's, it just always continues to grow more awesome to me. And, and for Jill, my wife too, we just, we love the church. Anytime I say, Jill, I got to go at night, I got to go do something, go. She's never said stop because she loves the church. And it's really important for a pastor to marry a wife that loves the church. <laughs> it could be bad otherwise, and I've seen it. Secondly, keep your leaders accountable. Keep your leaders accountable to their qualifications. In 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, Paul gives the church qualifications for its leaders. Those are public. Those are for you so you can examine our lives to make sure we're doing the things that God has called us to do. And so know those passages. We preach on those things because I think they're so important. Those qualifications actually directly relate to what leaders do in the church. For instance, manage your household well. Because the church is like a big household. If you can't manage your own little house well, how are you going to manage this bigger household? Just simple, th it's, it's just, it goes right across. So in this case, what happened in the temple, there's four qualifications that Paul gives that would have helped with some of this. So one of the qualifications is the elder shouldn't be greedy. Another qualification is the elder should not be a lover of money. Another qualification is the, the, an elder should not be fond of sordid game. Elders shouldn't be into get-rich-quick schemes. Because what they'll do, what an elder or pastor will do, if they're into that stuff, they're going to manipulate you to be a part of these things, and you're going to feel like, oh, I guess i got to do it because the pastor says so. Bad. So, the church shouldn't be shaking people down all the time asking for money. At the end of the day, that's kind of where we're at. We shouldn't be taking multiple offerings, multiple fundraisers, all this stuff, and just keep shaking you down. I love what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.8. He said, we worked hard day and night so we would not be a burden to any of you. We worked hard so it wouldn't be a burden. <laughs> church. If any of us are ever a burden to you financially, it's not good. It's not good. A couple things we do in the church to safeguard finances is we pay a non-profit auditor I think they're for profit, but they, they audit nonprofits. <laughs> I think. Uh, but we pay them a lot of money. We pay them like six to ten thousand dollars to get audited once a year, and they go through all our books, go through everything. It's JT's worst time of the year because he has to open you know, it's just it's a lot. They do a lot. But it's so good that we do that so we don't end up in the press democrat like some other churches that are extorting money because there's no accountability. So that audit is really important. And we don't have to do it. We do it voluntarily because we just think it's a good thing. There's a lot of money that flows through here with the church and school, over $2 million. So we want to make sure it's all accounted for. We have an open book policy. Anything you have questions about, any ministry, any pastor's salary, anything you want, go talk to JT. JT, raise your hand. This is JT. He's our business manager. He'll tell you anything you want to know. He'll take you into the office, open up, whatever. We can't go into the employee files. Those are confidential. But other than that, it's all open book.
be leery of churches that look and feel corporate, that have become a house of merchandise. They're always pushing their merch, they're pushing, pushing their brand, constantly soliciting for funds, constant marketing campaigns. Be leery of that. We take an offering because we believe giving is an act of worship. That giving goes to support the church, the staff, missionaries, ministries. That's where the giving goes to. Last week, on top of just the normal chapels at school and Bible teaching and youth service and children's kids night, um, men's and women's Bible studies, adult Bible studies. On top of that, just last week, Tuesday, uh, myself and Steve and Richard, we went up and did two services up at a senior home up in Hillsburg. On Wednesday, we had a couple come in and we, we got the word to about 30 families of how to have good parenting and marriage. Friday, we housed about 30 homeless people. We did a service for them Friday night. And so I just share that, like, this is where your offering's going. This is what we're doing. We're just trying, we're, we're kind of like Pez dispensers. We're trying to get the word out as much as we can. Just open, go, go, go. Just get the word, get the word out. Because the scripture is so powerful. Third, remember whose church it is. Remember whose church it is. So again, in this passage, it's emphatic. My house will be a house of prayer. So the church is Jesus' church. He's the owner. He's the one who bought it with his blood. It's not our church. This isn't my church. When people ask me, Lance, how is your church doing? I pretty much always correct them and say, do you mean the church that I get to pastor at? How's that doing? It's doing great. There's people there that love the Lord and they love his word and they're wonderful people and they want to grow together in Christ. That's not my church. Peter says to the elders, shepherd the flock of God among you. It's you're God's flock, and for some reason, you came here <laughs> to gather, to worship. But you have the freedom to go to other churches, to go, you know, there's, there's just freedom in Christ. Sometimes people leave and go to another church, sometimes people leave another church, come here, whatever. There's, there's so much freedom in Christ. And if we ever try to manipulate you to stay, like, whoa, that's, that, it gets weird. I just tell you, go where you're going to be happy. Go, we're going to worship the Lord with other people. Church is awesome. Fourth, the church must continue to preach and teach the truth. The church must continue to preach and teach the truth. So remember what Jesus did after he cleansed the, te the temple, what did he do? Day in and day out that week, he went in and taught in the temple. What did he teach? Chapter 20, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple, preaching the gospel, the chief priests and scribes and the elders came up and said to him, and so what was he doing? He was teaching the truth and he was preaching the gospel. Well, he hadn't died yet. He wasn't buried yet. He wasn't risen yet, right? That's the gospel according to 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died, buried, and raised according to the scriptures. That's the good news. But before that happened... He was still preaching good news. And he was preaching the good news of the kingdom. And he was preaching the good news of freedom and, and victory and stability. All, the word gospel, it wasn't new to Jesus. Actually, the, the Romans were already using the word gospel. When they would win battle and come back, they would give gospel. They would give good news. We are victorious. We are free. We are stable. There is peace. There is joy. All these parts of the gospel. So when Jesus comes in, he's preaching the gospel. All those things are found in Christ. Freedom, joy, stability, victory. That's what he's preaching. It's going to be found in me. It is found in Christ. P. 
peace with God, stability of faith, victory over Satan, victory over sin, freedom from rules and regulations of religion. It's for freedom, Paul says, that God has set you free. Fifth, fifth challenge. Oh, let me read it just quickly. This is from Alexander Strzok. This is from the book we're studying for deacon training right now. He says this, The Apostle's speech is in 100% agreement with the rest of the New Testament's extraordinary emphasis on preaching the Word of God and teaching all believers to obey all that Christ commanded. Christianity was and is a preaching, teaching movement. Therefore, the Apostle's words are as relevant today as they were in the day they were spoken. God's Word creates, edifies, protects, strengthens, encourages, and guides the church. Right? So what should the church be doing? We have to continue to preach and teach. So important to the life of a church. And then lastly, fifth, strive for personal holiness. Strive for personal holiness. <clears throat> Some of you who have been Christians for a while, you understand this, and you can check out now and think about where you're going to go to lunch. Some of you are new to Christ, and you need to get this. Okay, This is so important. So in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So where God's presence dwelt in the old covenant and was in the temple, in the new covenant, in today's covenant that Christ brought in, God dwells in believers. He dwells in you. You are the temple of God, you individually but also you corporately. So the next verse in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, do you not know that you, plural, are God's temple and that God's spirit... Oh, no, no. Uh, Yeah, it's real similar. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So you individually, God's spirit dwells in you. I loved what one member of our church said last week. We were somewhere and he said, the Holy Spirit is my best friend. <laughs> he gets it. <laughs> so I, was, I never heard anybody say that before. Anyway, he said it. It's great. Um, the Holy Spirit dwells every believer, but also us corporately, right? He, he, he indwells us. Okay. So then one other just application of this is in 1 Timothy chapter, or 2 Timothy 2. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Every house. Your house, when you go home today, there's, there's some vessels for honor and there's some vessels for dishonor. The vessels for honor you usually have in a cabinet. You take them out at nice times. The vessels for dishonor, you go on it about twice a day and sit on it. <clears throat> Verse 21, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, thing you, you sit on, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. This scripture, when I understood the scripture, Christianity really started clicking for me. And that is holiness has a purpose. As you strive for holiness, personal holiness in your life, and you're repenting of sin, you don't just do it to do it. You don't just do it to look good. You do it to be useful to God. When you repent of this stuff, crappy stuff, you're now going to be useful to the Lord. So holiness is usefulness. See? And, and, and all, all it is, this is, it's really simple. All it is is that when people see your life, they look up. That's all it is. That's all what it means to be holy, is that your life is reflecting God to people. And so it's just, when, I, when I'm ever around people, like if I can just get them to look up, I don't know what, I, I'll talk, whatever. I just want to be that. That's the purpose. Okay, so what a wonderful thing, right? To, to be a holy vessel that people see your life and look up and want to know, know your God, know God. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. We thank you for your heart for the temple. We thank you for the old covenant and all the things that it teaches us today in the new covenant. And I pray, Lord, as we are the temple of God now, individually and corporately, that you would just um, show us where we need to turn from and repent of, 
uh, you do cleanse your temple, you do cleanse us, and so we thank you for that work in our life, Lord, the conviction and the cleansing that you bring through your blood, and I just pray that you would continue to, to use this house to bring you honor and glory. Lord, help our leaders to stay on task, help us to, to help the church to, to keep us accountable, that we, we want to be, uh, be faithful to you and to your church, and so I pray you'd help us with that. And I pray that you'd help us in the days moving forward as we even think about even next year and what you want to accomplish in and through um, Windsor Christian. And so we thank you for this morning, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.